Have you ever wondered how time and time again, the artists at Disney are able to create such iconic characters that you love? Whether it be from a young age or as an adult, you just seem to connect with the characters on a level that seems to have that Disney magic. That magic that keeps you waiting, wanting to know what their next movie is going to be about, and where it's going to take place, or how the characters are going to look like. Or maybe you've tried your hand at drawing them, or creating, but they seem to be lacking that iconic Disney look. For those of you that want to know how Disney creates their characters, or interested in designing your own characters for your own movies or games, stay tuned because in this video, I'll go through some of the general philosophies that our friends at Disney presented at our past ZBrush conventions. A lot of research goes into creating the characters. Looking at all the different animals, the artists study everything from how they run, how they interact with one another, and also zoom up close to see how some of the fur clumps together in the breeze. A lot of research goes into the worlds these characters live in as well. Some of the environments are so important that they almost get treated like a character with the amount of research and details that they have to put in. I think that's why the Pride Rock has been treated almost like a character, because you wanted to have a hero uh, presentation for that asset itself. Studying nature was a key part of the research Disney used for Zootopia. Here's Zach Petrock from Walt Disney Animation talking about the design philosophy. The smaller is to the greater as the greater is to the whole. So what we're talking about is that leaf, look at the veins in the leaf, the smaller, to the greater branch, so the veins echo the shape of the branch as the greater, and the greater is to the whole. The shape of those branches echo the trunk of the tree, right? It's something that happens in nature. It's a really fundamental design philosophy. In conjunction with this research they were doing, they, they, like these rock formations in China, they look like skyscrapers. It almost looks like a city already, and it, and it has the beautiful depth of field and these things that are happening. So they're looking at how all these natural forms relate to one another within that world, and then how that's going to impact the design. Uh, we also did a lot of research on organic architecture, just looking at the, the, the really beautiful shapes and thinking about the fact that you know, these animals exist in with a, a world with no humans, so what kind of buildings would they build? Why, what would those look like? So if you look in this next shot, you'll see the building, see those Gaudi shapes. It's obvious now when you look at them, those round shapes. Looking at the sprinklers, they're made out of, of pipes that look like trees. Those are all deliberate choices. In the opening part, if you look at, this, look at the stilts that hold up the bridge, they're tree branches, right? This is all happening in the jungle. There, there are reasons behind all those things and this is how they're all coming together. Same thing with this sequence. Look at, you know, you have repeated horn shapes. You have some of those pine cone element ideas and some of the Gaudi architecture and structures. The horn shapes on top of the train station. Right? It, I, I really love this sequence because it was one of the most difficult things that we've had to go through thus far as a studio. And if you look back at this, the, there are maybe seven or eight sets here that are used one time in this movie. Some of these sets you see for one second, two seconds at the most, but look at the level of detail and, and attention to design idea that's happening in these. So I, I really think that speaks a lot to the commitment the studio has to doing these things um, with as much passion as possible. All that research goes into creating a lot of different designs that end up going back and forth between Disney's 900 plus people at Disney Studios. So what that means is that we are all in this building, which is kind of amazing because the entire team that creates these films is right there. So from the first floor to the top floor, if you have a question, you can find the person that has the answer in this building. That's a really unique thing, especially in this day and age, the way visual effects. We can learn a lot about how Zach and his team at Disney methodically designed characters from his presentation about Zootopia. We've had animals in an animal world behaving uh, like humans. We've had animals in a human world. We've had animals acting like humans in a human world. But Zootopia is something new. This because Zootopia was unlike any other prior films involving animals, they had to create a world where humans never existed. This enabled this team to create MVPs, also known as Minimum Viable Product. So what does that mean? It means that as you're going through these things, you want to put the minimum amount of effort into your creation to get feedback. And that's where ZBrush is, is so uh, fundamentally important because I almost feel like that's what it's been designed to do. That's how we utilize it at, at Disney for our design sculpt process that they'll get into. What you're doing is you're, you're taking what your minimum effort you could put into something is to gather feedback. Can you guess who this is? That's Wreck-It Ralph. 
Can you guess who this is? Wreck-It Ralph. And this? Yep. How about this? All right, last one. You guessed it, Wreck-It Ralph. So after creating these MVPs, how do you narrow it all down? Better yet, once you decide, how do you refine your characters even further? As soon as you know what that story is, then that should become the driving factor of your design choices. Everything you're doing in Zebra should revolve around that. A simple example, if they said, okay, Wreck-It Ralph is now going to be a creature that comes up from underground and wrecks things. You have these two choices, this one or this one. For me, it becomes much more obvious which one, would you, would, which one you would choose, right? This one. For me, this guy clearly doesn't live underground. It's just there are innate understandings of what this character implies that say, compared to this guy, that doesn't fit the story as well. So story becomes that driving force. For Big Hero 6, one of the earliest concepts of Wasabi started off with dreadlocks. The clothing is heavily influenced by Japanese culture because he lived in a San Francisco-Tokyo hybrid city. So as we're developing these films, uh, there, come, there came a point where that all went out the window. We need to pare it down, make it a little more of a simple read, and then get a character trait that can also add opportunities for humor. So they said, all right, I've got it. Let's make Wasabi a hypochondriac. Let's make him someone that is uh, you know, afraid of germs, a germaphobe. It's an easy, simple thing to get. It, it's going to afford opportunities for jokes. Okay, great, let's do that. As soon as we said that, the next sentence out of someone's mouth was, okay, we have a germaphobe with dreadlocks who never washes his hair. Okay, what do you do with that? So we started, we started that design process over again. We took off the dreads, but when you, when you design something the right way, it works as a whole. Right? So when we took those dreads off, it didn't make sense. The, the design just wasn't as appealing, it fell apart. So we ended up uh, kind of landing on a hybrid area with this guy. So this is the wasabi you see in the film. He's got a much more reserved look, uh, a little bit of a Carlton from uh, the Fresh Prince kind of thing going on. And uh, a little As the story of Big Hero 6 got more complex, so did the characters and the traits that they inherited. So the next time you watch a Disney movie or create your next character, remember, do a lot of research and draw from the world around you. Create a bunch of versions to cover a wide net of ideas and make sure to let your story drive your design decisions. If you found this interesting and want to watch the full presentation, I'll leave a link in the description below so that you can check it out. Please make sure to subscribe to our channel and give a thumbs up if you want to see more content like this. Also, feel free to comment down below on what other videos you'd like to see. And if you want to try your hand at designing your own Disney character in 3D, there's a link to a free version of the same program that Zach and his team at Disney uses below. This is Kingsley from Pixelogic. Happy ZBrushing. So setting up a rhythm, setting up a straight to curve, all these are the same. It's interesting, right? Everything becomes a curve and a diagonal. Even the light is, is not straight. It's at, a, it's at a strong diagonal. Look at the arch of his back as, as the predator is arched over and moving. Everything about the animation is set up uh, in, in a completely different way that will juxtapose the straights that they set up at the beginning. So again, just that idea.